The Moon Over Star by Diana Hutz Aston, illustrated by Jerry Pinkney. Once upon a summer's morning in 1969, Grandpa led the singing in church, the light of Sunday gleaming on his silvery head. Through the open windows, our voices sailed over Star, our town. Then we bowed our heads and prayed for the astronauts, Neil Armstrong, Edwin Aldrin Jr. and Michael Collins. If all went well, a spaceship would land on the moon today, and I dreamed that maybe one day I could go to the moon too. My gramps thought the space program was a waste of money, but I knew he was praying for them too. I thought about the astronauts' kids and wondered if they were scared. Scared but proud. I know I'd be. I slipped my hand into my dad's and whispered so only I could hear. God, please bless the astronauts' children too. Once upon a summer's noon, my cousins and I scouted Grand's watermelon patch for the biggest one. It took three of us to carry it to a tub of ice. Three and a half, counting my littlest cousin, Lacey. We decorated the picnic table with pails of wildflowers. Then, our chores done, we built our own spaceship. From scraps we found in the barn. T minus 15 seconds. 12, 11, 10, 9. As the oldest grandchild, I got to be launch controller and Commander Armstrong. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Lift off. We have lift off. We closed our eyes, imagining with all our might the rumble, the roar, and the force of the Saturn rocket, blasting the spaceship into the stars. Then we were rushing through space at 25,000 miles per hour. I wonder how many miles it is to the moon, Cousin Carrie said. I'd been reading the moon stories in the paper, so I knew. About 240,000 miles, I said, and some scientists say it's moving away from us, an inch or so farther every year. I also knew that in May 1961, a month before I was born, President John F. Kennedy had said America would send men to the moon before the decade was out. Now that President Kennedy was in heaven, I wondered if he could see the astronauts. Was he smiling to know his dream was about to come true? That afternoon, we were helping Gramps with the tractor when Gran hollered, Come quick, they're landing! Gramps kept right on tinkering with the engine. The rest of us ran pow-mow for the house and squirmed around the television screen as it glowed with equal parts of moon and the spaceship called Eagle. We heard the voice of Commander Armstrong directing the landing. Forward, forward, he said. Then the newsman, we all knew, Walter Cronkite, exclaimed, Man on the moon! For a split second we were silent. The whole universe must have been. As we waited, waited, waited to hear the voice of an astronaut 240,000 miles away. And then... Houston, Tranquility Base here, Commander Armstrong said. The Eagle has landed. Boy, did we cheer. All of the cousins, and even the grown-ups. All except Gramps. I remembered something he'd once said. Why spend all that money to go to the moon when there's so many folks in need right here on Earth? Because we can, I'd almost shouted, but caught myself. I began to wonder then what Gramps' dreams had been. From the time he was little, he had worked the farm, doing the same jobs, day to day, season to season. When the crickets began to sing, Gramps took out his pipe. I pulled off his dirt-caked boots for him and stomped around the porch. Gramps, 
Will you watch it with me tonight? The moonwalk? I'm mighty worn out today, he said, but maybe. Suddenly I could see how tired he was. Lifetime tired. There were deep lines in his face. A farmer's face. An old farmer's face. All right, Gramps, I said. It's okay. Once upon a summer's night in 1969, we spread blankets and folding chairs on the edge of the yard where the buffalo grass grew thick and soft. The corn stalks whispered while we gazed at the pearly slice of moon and the stars gleaming like spilled sugar. What were the astronauts seeing right at this very second? Could they see beyond the moon to Mars or Neptune or Jupiter? I passed around a bowl of popcorn. What I could see above me and what I could see in my imagination were better than any picture show. Later on that summer's night in 1969, the television screen flashed with words that gave me goosebumps. Live from the surface of the moon. And Mr. Cronkite said, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon, on this July 20th, 1969. I didn't know it then, but there were 600 million people over the world watching with me and listening when Commander Armstrong said, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. All of us, from New York to Tokyo to Paris to Cairo to Star, and maybe even President Kennedy too, all of us watched it together, the astronauts bounding across the moon like ghosts on a trampoline. I felt a hand on my shoulder. I reckon that's something to remember, Gramps said quietly. Later, when it was as quiet as the world ever gets, Gramps and I stood together under the moon. What's mankind? I asked him. He puffed on his pipe. It's all of us, he finally said. All of us who've ever lived. All of us still to come. I put my hand in his. Just think, Gramps, if they could go to the moon, maybe one day I could too. Great days, he said, an astronaut in the family, who'd have thought? I smiled in the dark. My Gramps was proud of me. First airplane I ever saw, I was your age, was right over yonder, Gramps said, nodding toward the cornfield. That was something to see, oh boy, something to see. A sigh in Gramps' voice made my heart squeeze. Keep on dreaming, May, he said. Just remember, we're here now together on the prettiest star in the heavens. Gramps had looked to the moon all of his life. It told him when to plant and when to harvest. And once upon a summer's night, it told me to dream. <laughs>